Okay, uh, welcome to Johannes Brauner's uh, master's thesis presentation. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to my uh, talk about uh, scalable algorithms in non parametric computational statistics. So, uh, with the advent of uh, powerful computers in the last few decades, uh, many, uh, many methods that were previously un, uh, infeasible uh, are now uh, quite commonplace uh, in statistics. So, methods such as bootstrapping, uh, kernel density estimation, and Monte Carlo methods, uh, they are very computationally intensive, but they have an advanced sorry, of knowledge uh, quite a lot. Uh, and a, a very good thing with these methods is that uh, they become even more powerful each time new, uh, new and better computer hardware is developed. But there is a limit on how strong uh, a single computer can be. And uh, uh, it seems that in, in some ways we are uh, we're starting to reach that limit. And one way to circumvent this uh, is to uh, adapt our algorithms uh, in a way that, uh, that allows them to be utilized by uh, more than a single computer uh, at the time. So you have multiple com uh, computers uh, in a cluster uh, working uh, on the problem at once. Um, and there are many, uh, many pro different problems that arise when trying to adapt the methods in, in this way. Um, but uh, uh, if they are uh, overcome and uh, an algorithm is uh, implemented correctly and efficiently in a distributed manner, then you can quite easily uh, scale it uh, to use a more or less arbitrary amount of, uh, of rel relatively weak computers, uh, which together have a much stronger uh, computational power than any single machine could have. Uh, and so, uh, yes, a, a number of, work of computers working together on, class on the problem is called a cluster, and uh, uh, each worker, each computer in the cluster is called a worker. And so I have uh, looked at three different problems uh, and tried to uh, implement uh, uh, scalable or distributed algorithms uh, for them. And the three problems are global optimization, which is finding uh, extrema of uh, a real valued function, uh, finding trends in time series, uh, and uh, uh, histogram estimation uh, in uh, using the L1 metric. Uh, and all the distributed computing uh, has been handled via the framework uh, at GISPARC. So global optimization. The basic problem uh, is that we want to find the extreme values uh, for, the, for a function f from Rn to R. Uh, and without loss of generality, we are looking for uh, the global minimum of this function, since we can find the maximum by just uh, minimizing the, the negative of the function. And so in the, the example here, you would want to find both the, uh, the point A uh, and the value at A, f of A. Uh, in this uh, uh, search uh, interval. Uh, and so the way uh, I have approached this uh, is through a, a field called uh, verified computing, which is uh, where you keep track of errors uh, by encapsulating them in intervals. Uh, and the errors can come from many different sources. Uh, if you have some physical measurements, for example, uh, you can have uh, errors in your measurement device. But the errors can also come from, uh, uh, from for example, uh, floating point operations in a computer. Uh, because as we all know, computers are finite machines, but the real numbers are, uh, are infinite. And so we cannot accurately represent uh, every single real number in the computer. Uh, and so there is some, some round of error. But by uh, encapsulating this in an uh, in interval, uh, then we can uh, keep track of that the errors. Uh, and we can also do uh, arithmetic uh, on these intervals uh, where we preserve the uncertainty uh, along our uh, computations. Yes, so then uh, how to actually do the global optimization? Uh, the first step uh, is that we partition our uh, search domain uh, into, a, uh, into intervals uh, which overlap uh, only at the, uh, the boundaries. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, these intervals in, in reality will, will often be uh, multidimensional, but for the sake of visualization, 
uh, here we have, I have only presented the case with, uh, uh, in one dimension. And then the second step uh, is to uh, take all of these uh, uh, intervals in the partition, uh, and we, we perform tests on them to see if we can discard, uh, discard them from the, uh, the search of the global minimum. And there are many different tests that we employ here. Uh, and an example of them is the monotonicity test, uh, which is applicable when F is a, a continuously differentiable function. And this states that if F is strictly monotone uh, in a closed uh, interval, uh, in a, and it's monotone in at least one component, uh, then the uh, minimum cannot be find, found in the interior of that interval, and it can only be found in the, on the boundary if that boundary intersects with the original search domain's boundary. Uh, and so we, we perform these tests and, uh, uh, and usually discard uh, quite a lot of the, the intervals in the partition. Uh, but then the, the remaining intervals are, are then bisected and we repeat, repeat this process uh, until some, uh, some tolerance on the, uh, on the intervals are met. So usually, uh, usually we set some tolerance on how wide the intervals can be. So when they are small enough, we, we stop the search. And to do this in a distributed uh, fashion, uh, the idea is to uh, first set a very loose tolerance, epsilon, uh, and then we uh, partition the search domain, uh, similarly to how we did in the non-distributed case. But then we, uh, we distribute uh, all, of the, uh, all of the intervals in the partition uh, to workers in the cluster, and they uh, independently run the original algorithm uh, on this uh, with, uh, with this uh, very loose tolerance uh, epsilon. Then we collect back uh, the results of these uh, independent runs of the algorithm, and we keep only the best candidate intervals. Uh, and this is then repeated with a stricter tolerance uh, until, uh, until we get our, uh, our final result uh, where we are uh, happy uh, with how small the, the best candidate interval is. However, uh, it was found that this approach did not really uh, improve the performance when compared to, uh, to the implementation of, uh, on just a single machine. Uh, and this is mainly due to, uh, to two factors. Uh, one is the large communication overhead uh, that is associated with uh, uh, distributing and uh, collecting back uh, all of the, uh, the intervals and the results from the, uh, the algorithm from the workers in the cluster. Uh, and the other reason is that uh, uh, for this to be really effective, we would need a way to uh, interrupt workers when we know that, uh, that the interval that they are working on is, uh, uh, cannot actually be the best one. And this is, a, this is kind of a fundamental pro uh, problem in uh, distributed computing, uh, that uh, each, uh, each worker cannot, uh, usually cannot uh, have the entire state of the computation uh, in its memory at any one time. Uh, and there are, uh, there may be ways to, uh, to circumvent this, uh, but, uh, but that would, uh, that would need, need further development and uh, was, uh, uh, that was outside the scope of this physics, unfortunately. But then we move on to the next problem that I have uh, tackled, which is uh, trend detection in time series. So generally, we say that a time series has an upwards going trend if it is generally increasing over some, uh, some time period, uh, and that it has a downward trend if it is decreasing. And these trends can be either short or long term. So in, in the example here, we have a, towards the end of the time series, we have a, a period where we, we see a, a short term upwards trend. Uh, but over the, the whole time span that we, we see here, we, we have a slight downwards trend. That is a, a much more long term. And the trend detection algorithm that I have uh, adapted for distributed computing uh, is called Trend Calculus and was developed by Andrew Morgan in 2015. And he defines uh, an upwards going trend uh, as a period of higher highs and higher lows than the pre preceding period, and a downtrend within the uh, lower highs and lower lows. And the algorithm starts with, uh, 
with smoothing the time series in a way uh, to remove the noise from it. Uh, and this is done by uh, partitioning uh, the time series into non-overlapping windows and looking at only the maximum and minimum value of the time series in these windows. Uh, so here, the, in, here we have partitioned it into two windows where the, the second window has a lower both maximum and minimum. And so this would represent a, a downwards trend uh, in this framework. And then uh, what we are really after are the, the points where, uh, where the trend, uh, trends change. So we go from, for example, an upwards trend to a downwards trend. And this is called the reversal point. Uh, and, uh, uh, and each of the reversal points uh, are, uh, they are still points of the original time series. Uh, so if you take uh, all of the reversal points, uh, they are a subsequence uh, of your original time series, and they can be, uh, be then fed back in, uh, in as the input for another iteration of the, of the trend calculus algorithm. And this brings us to the concept of a, a reversal order, which is the number of iterations uh, where a point is a reversal point. Uh, and a low order reversal would then uh, indicate that a, a short term trend uh, has been been changed, while a high order reversal uh, corresponds to, uh, to changes in, uh, in much longer term trends. And to do this in a distributed fashion, uh, we immediately encounter a, a problem, uh, which is that the, the algorithm itself is inherently sequential uh, in the way that, uh, that it, it is absolutely necessary to look at these non overlapping windows uh, in sequence. You cannot uh, uh, look at one part and then another part somewhere completely <coughs> in, in the time series. Uh, but what we can do is we can uh, use uh, Apache Spark uh, to allow us to, to use very large data sets that, uh, that wouldn't uh, uh, fit on a, uh, on, on a single computer, uh, either in memory or, in, or even on the hard drive. Uh, or uh, it could also allow us uh, to use conceptually uh, infinite streaming data sets where we, uh, we continuously get new data, but we, uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot look at uh, look again at data that we have already received uh, since the amount that we receive is, is too large to feasibly store. And this makes the algorithm uh, scalable in data size, uh, but not in uh, runtime. Uh, but what we can do uh, is we can uh, uh, we can use uh, Apache Spark to uh, uh, to run several uh, several instances of this algorithm at once for different time series. So, for example, if we're looking at uh, financial data on the stock market, uh, we may be we may be interested in uh, in the trends in uh, in all of the stocks in an in an index, for example, uh, and then you can. Uh, in, in this way, you can uh, distribute uh, uh, this computation uh, by letting different workers run on, on different uh, on different uh, stocks in this uh, index. Style. And so here is an example where uh, where we looked at uh, uh, oil price data uh, at many minute level resolution over almost ten years, and this was approximately uh, three million data points. Uh, and the, the small blue dots uh, in this image uh, represent uh, fa fairly low order reversals, while the large red dots are, uh, are much higher order reversals. And we see that the small dots are uh, much more numerous and uh, correspond to, uh, to shorter term trends than the, the very large uh, dots. And then the final problem uh, that I have I have looked at uh, is L1 uh, density estimation. So here, the basic problem is that we are given a, uh, a sample X uh, of size N from some unknown density uh, F from uh, RD to R. And the problem is to uh, find some density estimate uh, Fn, uh, which is a, also a function from RD to R, such that the L1 distance between the, uh, the density estimate and the uh, the underlying density uh, is very small. 
And the problem here is, of course, that we don't know what the underlying density is. So that so we cannot uh, uh, we cannot directly compute uh, this L1 distance. But rather, we have to approximate it in, uh, in some way. Uh, and uh, uh, one class of uh, density estimators that uh, that I have looked at uh, are uh, histograms, uh, which are uh, piecewise constant functions based on the empirical distribution uh, of the sample. Uh, and so, uh, constructing a histogram uh, basically boils down to uh, finding a, a good partition of the support uh, for the sample, um, and then uh, and then we can use that uh, that partition uh, to to construct the, uh, the density estimate in each of the in each of the um, boxes of the, of the support. Uh, and uh, we further restricted ourselves to how the uh, how the support may be uh, may be partitioned uh, by using a, a tree-based partitioning scheme um, uh, called regular pavings, uh, and this works for uh, or boxes, which are products or inter of intervals, or you can think of them as uh, high-dimensional rectangles. Uh, and they work by, uh, and this works by, uh, you first take the, the root box, uh, called, which would be uh, the entire support uh, for, the, for the sample. Uh, and then, uh, uh, then you successively uh, uh, bisect this uh, uh, into sub-boxes, which you further uh, by set, uh, uh, to get a uh, to get a partition of of the entire uh, root box, uh, and this uh, uh, and the, the way you per, uh, you bisect this can be uh, recorded uh, using a, a tree structure, uh, so a rooted binary tree, uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, and and there uh, in the tree uh, each leaf corresponds to a uh, to a box in the in the partition. And notably, the uh, the box size here uh, is uh, completely determined uh, by the depth of uh, of a leaf of its corresponding leaf in, in the tree. Uh, but then, to uh, uh, to make an, an histogram, a histogram out of this uh, partition, uh, we also need to uh, associate each uh, uh, each box uh, or each leaf. They are more or less uh, interchangeable in, when we talk about. Regular pavings. Uh, we want to associate with uh, each uh, each box with a value. Uh, for example, the uh, the number of data points that uh, that actually fall into uh, into this box. And so, a, um, this is a what then we call a mapped regular paving, um, uh, and this represents a piecewise constant function from the root box to uh, to the set of whatever values uh, you. Uh, you associate the leaves with, so for example, you have a, an integer value uh, after regular filling. Uh, but then, uh, especially if we have a, uh, if our uh, data sample uh, has a high dimensionality, uh, then we run into a, a curse of dimensionality in that uh, the data set becomes very sparse. Uh, and uh, and to, uh, to accommodate this when uh, in the uh, in this regular paving scheme, uh, we can uh, if if we did didn't do anything, then a lot of the uh, of the boxes in the partition would act, would contain zero data points, and so saving them uh, or storing them in in a, in a computer would be uh, would be very inefficient, uh, and so we uh, we can omit the the, the leads or boxes which have which are associated with some default value. Uh, very neutral element, uh, which would, in the case of count data, uh, would be zero. Uh, yes, and then on uh, since an, uh, an MRP or a regular paving uh, represents a, a piecewise constant function, uh, then we can do uh, we can do pointwise operations quite easily on this uh, uh, on this function. So, for example, here. As long as they have the same root box, uh, so here, for example, this uh, this would be the sum of two, uh, the point by sum of two piecewise constant functions, uh, uh, which can can still be represented as a 
in, in this case, uh, as far as uh, And in the case uh, of, uh, of histograms where, uh, where the uh, MRP represents identity, uh, we can perform other operations on it as well. So for example, uh, we can marginalize uh, the density. Uh, so we project it from a, uh, uh, to a lower number of uh, dimensions. Uh, or we can look at uh, conditional densities, uh, which is where we, uh, we fix uh, a number of components uh, in the high dimensional density. And then to do the, uh, the scalable uh, or distributed uh, density estimation, uh, we consider the case where we have a very large, either we have a very large sample size M uh, or the sample is with a very high dimensionality D uh, or both of these cases at the same time. Uh, and this is uh, the, the steps to, uh, to per perform the, uh, the distributed density estimation in this case uh, would first be to, uh, to create an, uh, an extremely undersmooth histogram, uh, which uh, uh, with extremely small boxes, uh, so you have a very large depth at, uh, in the uh, in the tree that corresponds to your uh, your partition, uh, and then you map uh, uh, you map each point uh, in your data set to uh, to the uh, to the box uh, it falls into, uh, and then you count the number of data points in, in each box, uh, and in, in this uh, in this step. Uh, you should ideally have no more than one or maybe a, a few uh, data points per box, uh, which uh, uh, which makes it so that you really need to have a very, very, uh, very, very large depth uh, of your tree at this point. Then the second step uh, is to, uh, to successively merge uh, the leaves uh, of this tree um, uh, until you get a uh, a histogram, uh, which is uh, which is still uh, very undersmooth, but it's uh, at least small enough uh, so that you can uh, fit it inside the memory of a single computer. Uh, and then, in the last step, uh, you continue merging uh, the uh, the leaves uh, of this histogram uh, to get a a kind of uh, merging path uh, that goes all the way uh, to the trivial histogram which would be uh, only the root box where you put all of the data points. And then you perform an adaptive search along this, uh, this merging path uh, to find the best, uh, the best estimate uh, for your Instagram. So the, uh, the merging uh, is done by, uh, by using a, a priority function, uh, phi, uh, which takes the the count and the volume of a box. So the count is then how many, uh, how many of the data points in the sample uh, that, that falls into, into the box. Uh, and it returns a, a non-negative uh, read value number, or non-negative read uh, number. Uh, and then, uh, so for example, if you have uh, had a priority function, uh, which only uh, considers the, the count, so only the number of data points, uh, would merge that would merge uh, the boxes with the most combined number of points first. Uh, and this, although this merging algorithm is sequential, uh, we can uh, we can actually distribute it uh, by con uh, by splitting the tree into uh, subtrees and merge each subtree in parallel uh, until some limit uh, on the priority function is reached. Uh, and so it is through this limit that you that you can uh, make sure that. Uh, that the histogram is, uh, is small enough to, to fit into a single computer. Uh, and when, when this limit is reached uh, in the distributed computation, uh, you then uh, recombine uh, all of the subtrees to get, uh, to get the, uh, the histogram in, in only one computer. And then the last step is to perform an, the adaptive search. Uh, and this, uh, this is for the most part not distributed. Uh, so what you do is you continue using the priority function to, uh, but uh, to merge uh, merge the tree, uh, uh, yeah, merge the tree, and then, uh, uh, but but here you, you keep track of uh, of, you, 
in of the order in which uh, you do all, all of these merges. Uh, and this can give you a very, very long path, usually uh, many thousands uh, of histograms long. Uh, but then you choose uh, k uh, histograms along this path, uh, universally, uniformly uh, spaced, and you label them uh, using uh, labels in, in the set, uh, capital theta, which can be really anything. It's just used for the labels. And then for each ordered pair uh, of histograms, you find the, uh, the Sheffe set uh, for them, which is uh, the set uh, of points where, uh, where the first uh, histogram in the ordered pair uh, estimates a higher density uh, than the second, uh, the second histogram. And if you consider all of the, uh, the possible ordered pairs uh, and, uh, and compute their Sheffe sets, the, co the collection of all such sets is called the Yatrokos class. Uh, and the size of the Yatrokos class uh, grows with the, uh, the square of the size of, uh, of capital theta, uh, which means, and this is the reason why we, uh, why we have to choose only a few histograms uh, along this path and cannot, uh, cannot compare all of them uh, directly, which would be the ideal case. And then uh, uh, for, each, uh, uh, for each histogram, uh, we compute uh, uh, delta theta, uh, which is the supremum over all uh, Sheffe sets in the Yatrokos class, uh, of the total uh, the total measure of uh, of that uh, of the, the density estimate in uh, over that set, uh, and take the difference with the with the empirical measure uh, of that set uh, using uh, held out validation data. Uh, and this computation of the, uh, the empirical measure, uh, this can be done uh, distributively. So your validation data does not need to be small enough to, uh, to fit into a, a single computer. You can have that in, in distributed storage. Uh, and then we select the best uh, estimate by minimizing uh, this uh, uh, supremal, supremal de deviation. Uh, and, uh, and then we kind of zoom in uh, in the in this merging path, right? So we choose k new histograms, uh, which are close to the uh, to the best to our best candidate, and we then continue, uh, and then we re repeat this process with the, these uh, these new histograms, uh, and repeat this until uh, until the uh, our best candidate is chosen uh, uh, from uh, from k adjacent. Histogram. So there is only only the merger of one leaf that uh, that separates uh, each histogram in, in the final uh, step. Uh, and so then, uh, and, and uh, it is also uh, worth worth men mentioning that uh, that given some conditions on the, uh, on the priority function and uh, the limit you set there, uh, this is an uh, an L one consistent. Uh, Estimate uh, of, uh, of the underlying density. And so, for uh, to see that this uh, works in practice, uh, I simulated some uh, yeah, uh, some data uh, and uh, and computed uh, histograms from it. So here I uh, I simulated a, a two dimensional uh, standard Gaussian uh, and shifted it, uh, computed the uh, the histogram uh, and the the resulting histogram is a uh, is a map regular paving uh, representing uh, a density and so we can marginalize it to uh, a single uh, dimension uh, for visualization purposes as we have done here uh, and as we know the the marginals of a uh, of a standard bivariate Gaussian should be um, uh, should be standard. Uh, one dimensional Gaussians. Um, uh, so, and this is, uh, this is what we see here, uh, albeit uh, shifted since the bivariate distribution was also shifted. Uh, and this was repeated again uh, for, uh, the, for the case with the five dimensional Gaussian as, as well. Uh, and the, uh, we see it here, we also see at least the, uh, the general shape uh, of, a, uh, of a one dimensional Gaussian. Uh, it is much more 
choppy. It is uh, it's a lot less smooth than the marginal of the two dimensional case. Uh, and this is uh, this is due to the the two cases have the same number of data points. But in, since this has uh, a high number of dimensions, you could say that we have a lot less data per dimension. And so when we marginalize it, we uh, it's also lose uh, some some of that data, especially after the the histogram estimation process. Yeah, that. Uh, that was uh, all for me. Uh, thank you for listening. Feel free to ask any questions that you have. Should I maybe stop the recording and then? Yeah, probably.